Um, welcome everybody to uh, this very special event this evening. A panel discussion with my colleague Owen Paxton and two other distinguished scholars, uh, Rui Boussou and Philip Nord. Uh, they're going to be in conversation about the uh, re-edition, the re-release of Robert Paxton's uh, Vichy et les Juifs, which is being released in France by Calman Levy this month. Uh, I'm Rashid Khaldi, I'm the chair of the history department, which is co-presenting this event with the Maison Française. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Nat Family Foundation and its uh, president, Charlie Nat, who is a member of the Maison Française. There you are, on the um, who's also a member of the Maison Française Advisory Board for providing the support for tonight's event and for their general support of the Maison Française. Um, in fact, my distinguished colleague, Robert Paxson, does not need an introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Um, Robert Paxson is the Mellon Professor Emeritus of Social Science. He taught in the History Department from 1969 until 1997. He remembers better than I do. Um, and he remains actively involved at Columbia and in the field of research and, and, and writing. Um, he was guest curator for an ex exhibition at the New York Public Library in 2009 entitled between collaboration and resistance, French literary life under Nazi occupation. More unusually for a historian, he was called upon to testify in the trials of former Vichy officials Maurice Papon in 1997 and Paul Touvier in 1994, who were accused of crimes against humanity. Um, Robert Paxton's areas of research include the social and political history of modern Europe, particularly World War II and Vichy, Fran Vichy France, and the rise and spread of fascism in Europe. His greatest fame attaches to the fact that in the 60s and the 70s, he was the first historian, French or American, to establish uh, the active collaboration of Vichy, Vichy France with Hitler's Europe and the extent of the anti-Jewish policies adopted and carried out by the Vichy authorities. He did this on the basis, in particular, of research he carried out in the German archives. Um, he published, as you all know, I'm sure, Vichy France, Old Guard and New Order in 1973, and then the book that's now being re-edited, Vichy et les Juifs, with the co-author uh, uh, Michael Maris in 1981. Uh, as I'm sure you also know, his findings were considered a great shock to many people in France and elsewhere. They were cruelly received at first. Uh, they are now widely accepted. Everyone agrees that Robert was absolutely right in his analysis and that his evidence was overwhelming. Uh, historians in France even talk about la révolution paxtonienne <laughs> to refer to the groundbreaking impact of his scholarship uh, on the general understanding of the nature of the Vichy regime and its anti-Jewish policies. Tonight's discussion will focus on the new edition of Vichy et les Juifs, which uh, Professor, Professor Paxton has substantially re-revised uh, for this new edition by Calvin Lévy, uh, taking into account decades of new scholarship since the book was first published uh, in 1981, almost uh, 25 years ago. Joining uh, Professor Paxton in conversation this evening are two distinguished historians, one French and the other an American historian of France, who will discuss the impact of, of Professor Paxton's work over time, the importance of this new edition of this, of this groundbreaking book, and some of the debates around Paxton's influence on perceptions of the Vichy regime. I will keep the introductions brief. I'm sure you're interested in hearing them about me. Henri Rousseau is a leading contemporary historian and director of the CNRS, whose research largely focuses on the history, legacy, and memory of the Vichy regime. So it's particularly appropriate that he should be here to discuss this today. His major works include the Syndrome de Vichy, published in English as the Vichy Syndrome, History and Memory in France since 1944. Et un passé qui ne passe pas, translated as Vichy, an ever-present past. That's a good, that's a good translation. Um, I'm happy to, to inform you that uh, we hope and expect that Professor Rousseau will be joining the History Department as a visiting professor uh, in the near future. Uh, Philip Nord, I'm sure some of you also know, is the Rosengarten Professor of Modern and Contemporary History in the Department of History at an institution off of the wilds of New Jersey called Princeton University. His research focuses on the political and cultural history of modern France. His books include Paris, Shopkeepers, and the Politics of Resentment, 
the Republican moment, struggles for democracy in the 19th century France, Impressionists and politics, art and democracy in the 19th century, and France's New Deal from the 30s to the post-war era. Please join me in welcoming Robert Paxton, Henri Rousseau, and Philip Okay, first of all, is this on? And can you hear me? Is the no, mic on? No. No. I think it is. I think it is on. Is that, can you hear the mic now? Is that a little bit? Okay, well, we have to be with dispatch tonight, and so I'm going to cut to the chase. What is different? with this new edition. What did I change? Well, uh, I didn't change the major conclusions of this book. The main conclusions survived. Uh, 30-some years of, of, uh, of research and publication by other scholars. Um, what I could, could do with this enormous amount of, of new literature, and one of my readers says that I cite 160 new works in my footnotes, um, and what these have done have been to deepen and to shade and nuance the conclusions that Michael Barris and I presented in 1981, but uh, do not, uh, do not, uh, change them fundamentally. The first, uh, and I'll list four major conclusions. The first is that the Vichy regime adopted its own autonomous policy of excluding Jews from French public life uh, on its own hook without direct German intervention for internal reasons. This came not in a kind of automatic way because of anti-Semitism, but because the way anti-Semitism was refracted and exaggerated during the 1930s by the depression, by the fear of war, and by the massive arrival of, 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 of uh, emigres or refugees, of which France took in proportionally more than the United States did in the 1930s. And then there was the polarization of the Popular Front when France elected its first Jewish and its first socialist prime minister, which divided the country patently in two. Second conclusion that these measures were not a smoke screen, they were in fact applied and, and rather rigorously applied, and, and here's where we could go into much more detail in this later edition. Thirdly, that when uh, German policy arrived at the final solution in 1942 and began deporting Jews from France to the killing uh, factories in, in the East, uh, the Vichy government assisted in this process, <clears throat> firmly convinced that what it was doing was finally at long last getting the Germans to take back the refugees that it had helped send into France in the 1930s. And finally, in conclusion, the Vichy government made it worse for the Jews who lived in France than would have been the case uh, otherwise. And notably, uh, the Vichy government handed over to the Nazis 10,000 foreign Jews who were in the unoccupied zone. That is today, that is the same in an area where there were, were no uh, German uh, officials or soldiers at all. So, if we weren't going to change our conclusions, why uh, did we uh, produce a new edition? Well, uh, now the archives are completely open, and an enormous number of young French scholars and not so young French scholars have worked on this subject. And uh, it was time to, to try to uh, work this uh, enormous amount of new uh, data about the application, about the details, and about the, about the fine shadings in, in, into the work. And so we made some adjustments and made some things more precise. One has to do with the application. Uh, we assumed in 1981 that things were, from what we could tell, these measures were fully applied, the exclusion of, of Jews from teaching, from the public service, from the cultural professions, and eventually quotas in the professions of the university. That we, we presumed that these measures were applied, and now we know agency by agency exactly how many people were removed and uh, that has, has deepened and enlarged our knowledge uh, greatly. But the discovery was that it was not simply the zealots 
of the um, Commission for Jewish Questions, Commissariat General aux Questions Juives, who carried out the application. But these measures were applied by the traditional French bureaucracy, the bureaucracy that Vichy inherited from the Third Republic, indeed from the Popular Front. One of the most extraordinary documents that I saw in the archive, which is now open to everybody, were the minutes of a meeting in early December 1940, uh, presided over by a, a very senior, very respected uh, civil servant named Maurice Lagrange, uh, who had a representative from every ministry. They were going over the application of the Jewish statutes and the various exclusionary measures. And each ministry had to report on their progress and special problems they had encountered and how they were going to carry this out. Uh, Maurice Lagrange had never been known to associate with any anti-Semitic movement in his earlier life, but he was like any uh, Third Republic public servant, deeply committed, even, even more so after the collapse of 1940, to the uh, reinforcement of the French state. And he was imbued with a positive conception of law, which said that the government, which uh, contended that the government represented the popular will, and when the government passed a law, it was the law. And so uh, he, he was seeing to it. He, he, this was before the uh, High Commission for Jewish Affairs was even created, which was, happened the following March. And so he was the person who was really seeing to the enforcement. Uh, Maurice Lagrange soon moved on to other functions, and he was not troubled after the war. Uh, he was a respected civil servant in the European community at the beginning, in the Cold Steel community. He had, had a normal career after the war. First, uh, first adjustment. The second thing was that we were obliged to uh, admit that Marshal Pétain himself had played uh, a more direct role in the drafting of this legislation. Uh, a third uh, improvement was that we could be more clear about what German policy was. And the great, the great um, problem with a great deal of writing about the Vichy government is that it uh, does not uh, say enough about Germany. It attempts to write this history I like the sound of one hand clapping, you can see the French side and the German side remains infinitely powerful. Uh, one understands this, uh, this attitude, this belief, given the, uh, the, the character of the French defeat in 1940, and the idea seemed to be the Germans were supermen, they were all powerful, and there was one under every bed and one behind every tree. Uh, and uh, it was not clear at all uh, what the Germans wanted to do with Jews in France. Well, uh, there's several uh, important points to be made. The first is that German policy in 1940 was not yet the extermination of Jews. It was the expulsion of Jews. And they were looking for places to send German Jews. They thought of Madagascar. Uh, they thought of Kenya. And in 1940, what better than the south of France? And so uh, they, they, were, they were sending thousands. This is after the armistice. I'm talking about the 30s now. This is after, uh, this is the fall of 1940. The Third Reich is continuing to send German Jews in sealed trains into southern France. The Vichy government is yelling at them to stop, to stop. We've got too many refugees already. So this flood of refugees from the 30s is continuing because of, uh, of Nazi policy. Um, now, uh, so, the Germans wanted something very different with unoccupied France than what Vichy was giving them. Vichy was giving them a, a, a state where the, where the Jews were pariahs and were being excluded, and the Germans wanted to think of France as a place where Jews were to be sent. Uh, this, uh, it's, it's not what you think. And then, of course, the policy that you remember so well, the extermination policy, begins in 1942. And um, there, uh, the, the Vichy regime is, uh, is helping out because it's been asking the Germans for years to take their refugees back and now they've discovered that the, the Germans want to take them back. And there's this moment of, of, of complicity. Um, now, um, I, we said in our book that there had been no German direct pressures and this is, a, I think, I hope even more obvious. But there were some indirect pressures, the main one being that the Nazis began to confiscate Jewish property in the occupied zone, in Paris uh, and in the major cities in the north. And the Vichy regime moved very quickly to insert itself into this process so that these properties were to be 
uh, and we managed to pass into Aryan hands, according to the term, terminology of the period, and that those hands should be French and not German. And by and large, the Germans uh, agreed to this, and that would, will surprise you. And the reason is expressed very clearly uh, in the documents that we've seen. The, the German administrators say, we don't have the personnel to manage this huge operation of Aryanization. So we'll have to leave it to the French. And this is one of the other things that's very difficult to understand. That the German occupation could not have functioned without the assistance of the French police and the French administration. And that was a point that we uh, suggested in the first edition and can, can uh, uh, nail down, I think, much more, much more carefully in this edition. Now, uh, we wanted um, to uh, bring out a new edition of Vichy et les Juifs in France, uh, partly because there had been all of this new work, but also because the French edition was out of print. Uh, it was not, it was, not, was not available, uh, and that seemed to be too bad at a time when this subject is uh, more burning than ever, more contentious than ever, the subject of a great deal of public debate. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it seems to us that there is a, 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 a ameliorative tendency going on in some circles in France. Nowadays, there are books coming out that saying that France wasn't so bad, it's, uh, the, and, they, and they use uh, a, a, a rough kind of comparison based on, uh, on the final outcome. And indeed, uh, only two countries uh, um, lost a lower percentage of their Jews than, than France, than Denmark, where practically everyone was uh, taken out to Sweden, uh, as you know. And there was Italy, where the police and the administration did not assist, as long as Mussolini was in power, uh, did not assist with deportations, though they indeed enforced Mussolini's own anti-Jewish discriminatory legislation. And there the uh, proportion of Jews taken was about 16.5%. And, and in France, it was about 25%. And then, of course, you go up very rapidly and very steeply into the other countries. And so there's, there have been some works that come out and say, well, look at the final result. It wasn't so bad. We must have been doing things that aren't so bad. And I was reminded of, of uh, a Columbia colleague who said to me, when I first came at the end of the 60s, you know, he says, everyone says how hard the Indians had, had it, but look, there are more Indians now than there were at Columbus today. It couldn't have been so bad. <laughs> And that's the kind of result you come up with when you do this kind of global comparison of the final figures. And so we tried to look at the mechanisms uh, of, of, of the deportations and the, and the factors that make them that made the, uh, the deportation more or less uh, efficacient. And uh, it, it was clear to us that France was a country with uh, with uh, considerable resources for concealing. Uh, and, and hiding and uh, uh, saving the lives of, of, uh, of Jews on the run. And that uh, uh, without the aid of, of the French police and the French administration, things might have been closer to the Italian uh, total than to the Belgian or the Dutch. Um, and uh, they, we tried to come up with a kind of hierarchy of, of uh, causes for uh, the things that propel uh, these uh, deportation movements. And the most important one uh, was the amount of German effort and the amount of German will. And this was always somewhat limited in France because the theory of the German administration was that uh, this was to be a, a, a regime of oversight, of supervision. The, the Germans didn't have enough manpower, they needed everybody in the eastern front, and the French were supposed to do the, the heavy lifting. Uh, another factor, of course, was uh, was uh, popular anti-Semitism, and where it was lacking, as in Holland, uh, that didn't seem to help much. But where it was present in places like Antwerp, uh, it made things much worse. Uh, in the French case, uh, it sometimes made things worse because there were people who denounced Jews to uh, the Nazi police. There's a further claim being made and that is that the Vichy regime tried to protect uh, French uh, Jews who were French citizens, uh, even if that meant uh, sacrificing uh, the foreigners. And that, of course, uh, doesn't stand up. It was a bestseller by a man named Eric Zemmour called Le Suicide Français that takes up this argument. 
and um, uh, it doesn't stand up for a moment because uh, the, all the legislation of those first two years was directed at French citizens as well as against foreigners. Uh, the teachers, the civil servants were almost all citizens, perhaps all citizens. Uh, the Aryanization of property affected French citizens particularly because they tended to have more property than immigrants uh, in general. Uh, this doesn't hold up for a moment. And what they've done is seize upon some rather late and inefficacious uh, steps uh, taken in the summer of 1942 to try to keep French police from being used and arresting French Jews who were French citizens. But that didn't slow things down very much, and there was never any real agreement between each and the Germans uh, that uh, French citizens were going to be spared. Uh, the German authorities kept telling Pierre Laval and other uh, negotiators that uh, they were all going to go. And, uh, Vichy never tried to impose a, a complete a blockage on these deportations the way that, for example, Bulgaria did. So we uh, persist in our position that the Vichy regime made it worse uh, than it would have been without uh, these actions of, of the Vichy government. And uh, so this is a, a French edition. I hope there will be an English edition. But uh, at the moment, that's uh, uh, remains in the in the, in the hands of the Stanford University Press. So, who's next? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> this, this one is working. No, but then you can. Okay, okay well, I have to confess I'm a little bit intimidated. <laughs> And it looks like 30 years ago, talking to my, my master, a historian who inspired me so much. So um, You have to move the microphone closer to your mouth. Okay, but that we use this one. Oh. Okay. Very much better. okay, is it fine? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, well, thank you for the invitation. I will do very brief remarks and then just to introduce the, uh, the discussion. And first of all, some uh, comments about this new edition. And I have to confess, this is a real challenge. Not because the topic is difficult, of course, the topic is a, a very accomplished one. But, but because to rewrite such a book, uh, 30, 25 years afterwards, it's a real challenge. Because a book, a book in history is not just information, and you can change the information year after year and build another building. Uh, upon the older one. Now, a book is a book inscribed and written in a specific context. And when you wrote this book, in, at least when it was published in France in 1981, the context was so different as it is today that it is a real challenge to produce uh, the same book, which is of course relevant. I will go back in a moment. I mean, the, it's spitting, it's still Satyan Kou, Satyan excuse me to say it in French. So, and, uh, and the context is absolutely different. Just some elements to remind what was going on in 1981 in France about this issue. I mean, it, it was the very beginning of the public discussion about, about Vichy. Uh, in 1979, for example, uh, there was the first indictment for crimes against humanity against Jean Leguet, who was the, uh, the assistant of René Bousquet in the next room. And it was a major break in the, the French tradition to, to see the, uh, former civil servant to be indicted. And no one could imagine in 79 or 19, 1981 that there would be major trials uh, on such issues. And this trial occurred actually in 1994 uh, with a two year trial. And I even mentioned Bobby Wong. Bobby was a German. Uh, and of course, the, the Papa trial. And, and the influence of Paxton's work, uh, the first I mean, one of the first one, Vichy Friend, and this one had a tremendous uh, role, uh, especially in, in, into the court. And if you take the situation today, it's exactly the reverse. I mean, Vichy has been examined, reassessed in all possible ways. There was many kind of reparation, even we can say we are in a sort of era of reparation with the trials, with the Commission Matteoli, who took in, uh, in charge of the question of the spoliation, the spoliation made by the Vichy regime, not by the Germans. They were the, uh, uh, for example, all Paxton's uh, tethys, including those on uh, 
from Vichy and the Jews are on the textbooks. I mean, any any uh, student in, in, the, in the high school is learning, knows who, who's facts, not only the heavies, but also the guy. I mean, you are in the index, you know, <laughs> the, the textbooks. You have Obama, Stalin, Hitler, Kennedy, and that's <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> So the, the, the situation is completely different. So and if you could rewrite properly and republish, uh, uh, publish the new version of this book, it seems that it means that the, the core of the book, the main thesis, is still relevant. And this is a, a challenge for today and for yesterday. I mean, you were right 30, uh, 24, 25 years ago. So uh, and. What is strange to my point of view and to see that what was new at that time remain interesting and they uh, uh, yes interesting today. For example, one of the character characteristic of the book, and this is not at all uh, a, a critic, uh, I don't criticize you at all, it's focusing on the question of French anti-Semitism, it's focus, focusing on the question of Vichy regime, the Vichy attitude, the Vichy behavior uh, toward the, the enemy. And you didn't get, for example, a, almost 300 pages to the first period, 1940, 1942, which is a period where, during which uh, the, uh, the Vichy regime was the main player in this issue. Then on um, the second period between 42 and 44, which is more specific and more focusing and, and dedicated to the question of final solution, where the two players, the Germans and the French, of course, had, had a uh, equivalent rules. So, uh, it, it's the, the, the only question I can raise here is, what could have been uh, uh, the, uh, the general structure of such a book written in today? I mean, would it have been exactly the same, with the same perspective, or would it have been, would it have been, been, been different? Um, to my point of view, probably slightly could have been different, especially on the, the question of the, not the role of the Germans compared to the role of the French, but the very uh, specific policy of, of the Nazis and, and mainly of the Zippo SD in France, which was different from uh, other countries. So which is, to my point, to be one of the main points to understand what was going on uh, on 1942 and, uh, and 1944. So uh, also what is interesting in this book and remain completely relevant is to see to what extent to understand Vichy France and the Vichy regime, mainly not Vichy France, the Vichy regime and the collaboration, uh, we need to understand the interactions between the two main players. This was your first thesis in Vichy France, and this is still the basis of any book on the Vichy regime. I mean, collaboration was not only a, a question of ideology, collaboration was a strategy. And when you study, when you examine the question of the Jews, it's a very good example, to my point of view. It's not the only one, of course, but the, one of the very good examples of how the Vichy regime was coping with this kind of issue. It's a discussion. I mean, the, for they have, there, there are two different antisemitism. The, the French one is not the German one, of course, we, we know that. But at the same time, there is a discussion between the two perspectives. They didn't share the French and the German. They didn't share the same... Come on, you know, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, targets, the same uh, objectives. Uh, the, 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 for example, the final solution was not in the agenda of, of, of the Vichy regime. He it accepted it because it was part of his own strategy. He didn't implement it, of course, but he accepted it rather willingly. But he had, he had it in mind in 1940 what could be the evolution of the of the Nazi Nazi policies toward the uh, uh, toward the uh, the Germans. So, uh, the second part is the, uh, not exactly what's new. You, you say what was new, and I have to confess, I read it in the play, I'm sorry, I, mean, I didn't have time to read it before. I received the proof two days before uh, leaving Paris, and I didn't have the two versions, you know, the, the old one and the new one. And then I read only the new one, and I could follow all the new uh, the, the editions by following the footnotes. I mean, any each footnotes uh, giving references after 1981 was an, an addition to the to the book. So I was really impressed because the, there were many, of course, but it was fitting. I mean, how there is, is it possible? It's fitting without changing the whole structure of the book, which is really again a, a challenge. So the other question would be: uh, 
how it fits with the recent historiography. I mean, many books have been published, I mean, more than 160, probably two, three hundreds in the last 25 years. One major difference, and I'm a little bit kidding, this is a place of Klausfeld's work in your book. I mean, if you take any current book in the history of the Jews in France during the war, you will see the dominant interpretation in the one of Klausfeld. I don't see it wrong, I mean, it's wrong. Uh, but uh, I mean, I was surprised that Klausfeld is quoted, of course, but it's not the major author you're quoting, and even you don't discuss with him. Uh, about some major points. I took one example just to explain what I mean. I mean, Klaasler did a great job. I'm not criticizing him, of course. But in, in, in terms of interpretation, you are not exactly on the same uh, on the same level. For example, when he published in 1983 Vichy Auschwitz, which was one of the first real historical accounts on, on the topic, uh, of course he had many archives. Uh, most of them coming from the Centre de Documentation Juive Contemporaine, not from the National Archive. Well, this is a detail. But mainly, he has in mind the future trial against René Bousquet. He was chasing Bousquet. Bousquet was the chief of the police, the secretary general of the police de Vichy. He was, it could be sure at that time. Nobody knew what could be possible. So the book was constructed as a, 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 a requisitoire. It was a, a kind of a, 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 prosecution. a, a prosecution job uh, aiming to put this guy on trial. And I remember what you said in, well, a long time ago in an interview, talking about, not about Vichy and the Jews, but about the, the other book, Vichy, Vichy Friends. Uh, when you did this, this book, you wanted to be get rid of judicial interpretation. You want to be get rid of this judicial framework, which has been one of the major problems in contemporary history, especially in France, and especially in this kind of issue. And this is very interesting to see the differences. You're attached to understand the, the policy toward the Jews in the framework of the, uh, the whole Vichy regime and the whole policy. I mean, it's not just Vichy and the Jews. It's, it's a way to understand what was the real nature of the Vichy regime. And in a certain sense, it's not a, it's not a, come on, it's not a scoop, it's not a scoop, it's a, it's a sequel. This book is a sequel of the, uh, of Vichy France. It's exactly in the same, uh, in the same uh, uh, framework. And, well, I, I will say uh, that um, what could be also new topics introduced in such, a, uh, in, such a, in such a book, which you couldn't do it because it was impossible to rewrite it completely. Probably, uh, a, a, a more recent work uh, would have focusing on the Jews themselves. This is one of the, of course it was not your, uh, your problem, you didn't want to focus on the whole question, but if you, I observe what's going on today in the historiography, you have a lot of books paying attention to, to the victims, but not only as victims, as players. I mean, what were their reactions, what were the kind of a uh, rescue, what was the discussion between uh, even some uh, Jewish associations and part of the, uh, of, the, of, of the officials. It's probably something which would have been more emphasized because of the uh, first a lot of research done in the last 25 years and also the, the very large number of testimonies which have been released uh, in, in, in the last decade. So, a third point, very briefly, uh, to my opinion, and it's not just because of your book, because of my, my own perspective on, on the topic, I think that some problems remain open. Mm. Open, and this a discussion is possible, and it's still the same. Uh, you, you won't be surprised. It's the question of the shift of the summer 1942. In the summer 1942, in the very beginning of the uh, implementation of the final solution in France, of course Vichy was involved uh, as a major player in the arrest of the Jews and so on and so forth, but at the same time you had a major shift just after the first roundup, for example after July 1942 and the, the, the roundup of the, the, the Veldi roundup, there was this famous shift uh, uh, within the public opinion. I mean, many books are repeating again and again and following Pierre Laboré's work that the French public opinion changed its mind after the first mass arrest. Not the first arrest, after the first mass arrest. 
they had the belief in the half of the Vélodrome d'Hiver, and then what happened in the south of when the Vichy regime sent to the north zone about 10,000 uh, 10, Jews. And this is to me an open question. I, I don't disagree with the idea, but what we can observe is there was a change within the Vichy regime, there was a change within the German institutions, both to care about what they call the public opinion, but I'm not sure that the public opinion as a whole really changed its mind. You know, you know the question. We, we're talking about the public opinion and the kind of a direct link between the opinion and the behavior of the Vichy regime. But what changed a little bit was it the, uh, the Vichy regime or the policy of the Vichy regime, especially between the, the summer 1942 and the summer 1943, when Vichy decided to stop any collaboration in the, uh, in the persecution uh, of the Jews for the Germans. Okay, so my last one would be a kind of a conclusion. I mean, the core of the book remained perfectly valid. And to my opinion, it's a welcome, and to, to, to publish a new version of this book, it's a welcome reply to some new fantasies or old fantasies about the period. The first one that Vichy protected the Jews. I mean, it's the old uh, argument. Even Zemmour doesn't know that what he is saying is Laval defense. I mean, he's saying some historians have done this and that. I mean, this idea that Vichy uh, sacrificed the foreigner to protect the, the French was an argument used by Laval at his trial. But this, this, this is the first, uh, the first, uh, come on down, the first element when you see this argument uh, on the public opinion, on, on the uh, on the public debate. And another thing about the rule, because this argument is still a, a debate. He was in fall, in a certain sense. I mean, the book raised a lot of controversies, but on this point, he was in fall, even by Marine Le Pen. She refused to follow her father, who wanted to follow this path and say, but I was a good guy, he protected you. She doesn't, she didn't want to follow him. So it means that you won. You won. I mean, they... <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, and another fantasy is, for example, the one of Jacques Semmel. We participated together to uh, a, a, a special issue of the debat about this book, pretending that if 75% of, of, the, uh, of the, the Jews were saved, it's because of the French opinion, because of the, the, the wretched or whatever. And it, it just happened, to, I want to quote what Jacques Semmel, who was, was a friend of mine, actually a colleague, and he sent the book to me with a dedication saying, pour en finir. Avec les années Paxton, you, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> Forget about the Paxton era. And I was really upset because I said, I don't want to finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Probably should pass. Yeah, that's the mic. Good mic. Good mic. Good mic. That isn't going to reach. If you talk like this. What's wrong with this? I like Bob's solution better. I can go Anyhow. Well, I just want to express, yes, that's fine. My pleasure to yeah. uh, be invited to participate uh, on this panel. It's a very really honor um, to be with Ari and to be with Bob, who was my dissertation supervisor. Um, so my task is a peculiar one uh, and partially scooped, if I might. Uh, I'm supposed to present the criticisms of Bob's work. Uh, and I, I'm going to do, uh, do just that. Uh, there are two major lectures. I'm going to repeat some things that have been said. That's the danger uh, of going last that, that you have to say has already been said. Uh, but one line of criticism focuses on Vichy's relation uh, with France's Jewish population, the other on Jewish survival rates, which were high in France in comparison elsewhere in Hitler's Europe, and I'm going to add uh, a line of criticism, well, I don't know if it's that, queer your concern uh, of my own having to do with continuities between the Third Republic uh, and Vichy, not a major theme in Bob's book, uh, just one that's important to me personally. So uh, I think it's actually worth, although Bob has done a very good job summing up his book, uh, to go over some of the arguments one more time, maybe in a little bit uh, more detail starting with the point that Vichy has an anti-Semitic uh, project uh, of its own. Uh, and on the matter uh, of uh, Vichy's project, Bob uh, and Michael Maris demonstrate the following. Vichy authorities identify and take a census of President Jews, 
citizens, both citizens and foreigners, they exclude them uh, from many walks of life, restrict them from others. In response uh, to German moves, uh, Jewish property is Aryanized by the French government. Uh, foreign Jews are interned or placed under surveillance from 1942. Uh, Jews must wear a stamp uh, identifying them as Jews on their identity papers. Uh, and in addition, the Vichy regime repeals the Crimea Law uh, of 1872, uh, which accorded or awarded citizenship uh, to most of the Jews uh, of Algeria. They were denaturalized by Vichy uh, at the struggle. Uh, as Bob has reminded you, uh, they were not intent uh, on extermination, Vichy that is, uh, or even on ghettoization. Synagogues remained open. Jewish children still attended public school uh, or joined Jewish scouts. Uh, and even some welfare services were provided to, uh, to Jews and Jewish refu refugees. But it was a population that was stigmatized, marginalized, impoverished, uh, and in a word, uh, persecuted. In the new edition, as Bob has told you, uh, he is, uh, and Michael Maris are more persuaded than ever uh, of these conclusions. Indeed, the new evidence uh, suggests, just as Bob told you, that Peytag was more of an anti-Semite than originally suspected. Uh, and uh, not only that, that the Vichy regular administration, not just the uh, zealous, was rigorous and dutiful in the application uh, of anti-Semitic uh, laws. I uh, should say something about Bob's analysis of Vichy's role uh, in the final solution. Uh, they demonstrated, uh, Bob and uh, Michael Maris, uh, that French police uh, were used time and again uh, for roundups that French census materials were made available to Germans and French rolling stock too. Uh, a major transit camp at Drancy uh, was run by the French uh, until 1943. Now, there were moments when Vichy grew less cooperative than Henri has evoked uh, just that moment. Uh, in the summer of 1942, for example, uh, the regime refuses to obligate Jews in the unoccupied zone to wear the Star of David. German government wanted this. Uh, the Vichy regime refused. And again in 1943, the Germans wanted all Jews stripped of citizenship, and Vichy uh, refused to go along with this. Neither, uh, according to uh, Bob and Michael Maris, uh, redounds to Vichy's credit. The first refusal uh, was undertaken because the measure was unpopular. Uh, that is to say, making Jews uh, wear the Star of David in the unoccupied zone. And the second, because the tide of the war was clearly turning uh, by 1943. Uh, and it made sense in a pragmatic uh, way uh, not to be too closely associated uh, with the Nazis' extermination uh, policy. There may have been a slackening of cooperation, but not a complete cessation, cessation and not because of sympathy. Uh, for France's Jews uh, on the part of the Vichy regime, but because of concerns about the regime's flagging legitimacy and worries about the durability of the German New Order. And on this line of argument, too, uh, Paston and Maris have remained firm. Vichy's cooperation, as Bob just reminded you, was essential to making the machinery of deportation work. Uh, and uh, they cite a statistic up to 1942, 42,000 Jews were deported. This is during the period of uh, Vichy cooperation. In the second period, when the cooperation slackens, uh, that figure drops to about 33,000 altogether. Now, to come to the critics, and a number of them have already been evoked for you, Eric Zemmour, uh, his book, Le Suisse Francais, uh, from 2014. Uh, and his work is really based uh, on, the, uh, on the work of another man, Alain Michel, Vichy et la Shoah, 2012. Uh, and their claim is this, Bob has summed it up for you, Vichy's record wasn't that bad. How so? Because Vichy did his best to save Francais de Souche, old line uh, French Jewish families. Sure, uh, the regime had an anti Semitic project of its own, but it also wanted to preserve its sovereignty and to protect its own. Also, uh, the, uh, Michel in particular uh, points out that Vichy allowed Jewish organizations like Jewish scouts, but some others, uh, to exist, and they play a role uh, in Jewish rescue. Uh, so uh, that somehow was to Vichy's advantage. In Michel's phrasing, Vichy was l'élément principal, the principal element in making Jewish survival possible. Uh, just 
two observations of my own in this connection. I'm sure Bob could demolish this better than I can. Um, so about 330,000 Jews were resident in, in France uh, at the beginning uh, of the occupation. 190,000 of them were French Jews. 25,000 of these were deported and almost all uh, will die. Many are arrested by the French police in Paris, Marseille, and Bordeaux. Uh, and the observation that Vichy deserves credit for Jewish acts of rescue is just incredible. Uh, if, you, if I beat somebody up and steal their money and they perform a good deed, I do not see how that redounds to my, to my credit. But let me turn to the second line uh, of criticism, uh, and that has to do with survival rates. This has already been evoked to you. A rough 250,000 Jews will survive, about 75% of the total. Uh, 230,000 of them are still on French soil. How is this possible? Well, I'll start with a minor point uh, that's in uh, Paxton Maris. Uh, and that has to do with the existence of an Italian zone of occupation. Uh, the Italians were less committed uh, to uh, anti-Semitic persecution and certainly to the application of the laws uh, connected to the final solution. And that Italian zone, uh, which included Nice, uh, became a relative safe haven uh, until Mussolini's fall, uh, after which the Germans took it over uh, and it no longer uh, became so, or no longer remained so. Uh, uh, Maris and Paxton, however, lay greater stress still, I think, on the German role, and Bob has reminded you of that uh, just a moment ago. The Germans were most effective when it came to implementing the final solution when the following conditions were fulfilled. When they went at it with a will, when Wehrmacht was on the spot in large, large numbers, uh, helping out, cooperating, aiding and abetting, uh, and also when there were local willing collaborators, uh, willing to help uh, the Germans in the execution of their policy. In France, and not just repeating what Bob said, uh, the Germans did not uh, exhibit uh, this kind of will and, and determination. Certain elements did, but other elements uh, uh, did, uh, did not. Um, not only that, uh, the Wehrmacht, of course, was there uh, defending the Western Wall, but it was not a presence in the multiple millions the way it was uh, in, the, uh, in the East. Uh, there were no Isaacs group in, uh, in France, and to the extent that there was, it's the police that plays that uh, role of Vichy's, uh, Vichy's political, uh, political police. Uh, so the situation in France was very different from the situation uh, in, Eastern, uh, in Eastern Europe. Now, uh, to uh, Bob's critics on these various points. Three people in particular, their names, actually one hasn't been mentioned yet, Pierre Lavori. I know Sylvie Bernay counts as a critic, but she has something to say which I think uh, is, uh, is interesting. Uh, and Jacques Soumelin. And they see it a different way. Uh, it was the rescue efforts of France's citizenry, both Jews and non-Jews, and this comes back to the issue of Jewish agency, which uh, Henri uh, just mentioned a, a moment ago. That's what made the difference. Now, it's not that that issue is ignored uh, in past and in Maris. In fact, uh, Bob didn't mention it, uh, but the original French version, I don't know about the English version, but certainly uh, the second French edition, begins with the dedication uh, to all those French people uh, who helped uh, to, rescue, uh, to rescue Jews. On the whole, though, uh, the story uh, of rescue is one that happens post-1942, after the massive roundups of July and August. And even then, uh, I think uh, Paxton and Maris emphasize more the, the German side of the story. Pierre Lavoie, a specialist in uh, French uh, public opinion, uh, wants to argue that Vichy uh, uh, was being abandoned by public opinion even before 1940. It starts earlier, late 1941. It may just be, uh, uh, may just be a detail, but in any case, that's the drift uh, of his uh, of his case uh, of what he has to uh, of what he has uh, to say. Uh, the general issue being that 1942 was important, uh, but perhaps not as big a turning point as portrayed. Um, I, I'm, well, I'll leave Bob to, to deal with that. Uh, Sylvie Brené uh, works on the Catholic Church. Uh, and it's well known uh, that the roundups of 1942 caused a number of senior clergy uh, in the church to protest. 
But after 1942, according to Maris Pacton, uh, the church became more occupied with negotiating advantages for itself with the Vichy regime uh, and with dealing with the issue uh, of the German forced labor draft. Germany began to draft uh, French citizens for labor service uh, in, uh, in the Rhine. Sylvie Brunet, however, writes of 1942-1944 as le temps des sauvetages, uh, as the time uh, of rescue. Uh, and she uh, makes the case uh, that secular clergy and religious orders, some of them, uh, with tacit and even on occasion explicit consent from the church hierarchy, engaged in pursuing rescue projects of all kinds. Last of all, there is Semelin. He acknowledges the power of popular anti-Semitism, but insists more on behavior than thinking. The idea of the Jewish problem was indeed widespread, uh, but when it came time to decide what to do, whether to hide a Jew or turn him in, the French record was, he claims, a positive one. Just to add two additional points to this, uh, even at the height uh, of uh, the so-called concern, uh, or concern about the so-called Jewish question, that is before uh, uh, 1942, the dominant mode in public opinion, the argument goes, was indifference. I know how Bob's going to answer this, but I'll, get, I'll let him do it for self. Uh, indifference, at least according to Senla, did not mean approval. And when there was more active opposition after 1942, it took the form in part of outright resistance, but he insists more on so-called petit geste, uh, small gestures uh, of aid uh, and assistance. Well, now my own minor contribution uh, to the discussion, I'm sort of embarrassed to even add it, but I'll do it, uh, has to do with uh, continuity between the Third Republic and Vichy on the matter of anti-Semitism. It certainly is possible uh, and, and right up to a point uh, to see the 1930s in France as a warm-up to Vichy as a kind of curtain raiser. Uh, the currents of the anti-Semitism uh, of xenophobia in general uh, were quite powerful. There was a general acknowledgement among wide sections of the population that there was a Jewish problem, and that feeds into the enactment uh, of legislation uh, in the 1930s, uh, restricting access to certain professions uh, on the basis uh, of nationality or how recent your naturalization, uh, naturalization was. And not least of all, a system of internment camps uh, was set up to have an influx of refugees uh, at this time. Uh, the largest number of them coming from Spain as a consequence of the Spanish Civil War. Looked at this way, uh, the move from the Third Republic to Vichy was not a radical rupture and that's a quotation, but a story of, con uh, of continuity. I just make a few observations, and I'm not saying anything uh, Bob and Michael Maris don't uh, acknowledge. France was more welcoming uh, to refugees than most in the 1930s. We could be bolder and say than anyone, but uh, that, I won't go that far. Uh, there was, of course, a Jewish prime minister in 1936, but again in 1938. And during the war itself, uh, a Jewish minister of the interior, uh, Georges Mondel, whom Vichy uh, would uh, is it Vichy that murdered him? No, yeah, yes, the Middle East. The Middle East murdered him, okay. Uh, a law was passed in 1939 forbidding race-based hate speech uh, in the press, the La Marchandeau. And as for internment camps, France had them, uh, but it would not be the only democracy uh, to have uh, once the world was underway. Uh, Britain, of course, had them too. Uh, and I don't mean to remind you uh, that the United States had internment camps of its own, uh, not just for foreigners, but actually uh, for our own citizens. So I, just a little nudge, be more inclined uh, to see a, a, a greater break between the Third Republic and Vichy, but it may be just a question of nuance and on this particular issue. So in some then, Michel and Zemmour try to rehabilitate Vichy. I guess, this is puzzling why all this is happening now, because all the books I cited for you are in the last four or five years. Uh, I think that, not Klarsfeld, uh, who is generous to the French public, that's an old position that he's, that he's taken, uh, but for the, uh, the Semelin, uh, Lavorie, and Bernet effort to rehabilitate the French, that's, uh, uh, that's the second line. And then there's my own, which I don't know if I want to rehabilitate the Third Republic uh, regime, for which I have an uh, inexplicable soft spot, uh, but at least uh, to make its very real xenophobia look less thoroughgoing and exceptional. So I'm supposed to 
to uh, conclude with, with, uh, with, with a, uh, uh, with some comment on what my colleagues have said. My colleagues have been, have been so easy on me that it's uh, <laughs> how hard they, uh, how hard they uh, need to jab back uh, very strongly. Um, yes, I think if, I were, if one were writing this book today, one would certainly spend more time on the Jewish uh, the population of France itself. There are excellent books on that subject. Uh, if you tried to do them both, you would have either an enormous book or a, or a book that didn't really have to do full justice to both. So, um, uh, there's also uh, the resistance I should have worked in of the fuller study of all the, of all the assistance given by by people, which is uh, which, which I simply didn't didn't have time to do. Uh, I think most of the criticism is directed against me in, in, in France. Uh, and uh, this is particularly true of, the, of, of, of blogs. I tried to encourage Bill to read some of the nastier ones, but he, he, didn't, he didn't, didn't do it. But um, they think that I'm uh, guilty of France bashing and uh, uh, that uh, I most, most particularly uh, uh, deny uh, uh, that I do things that I uh, grossly uh, underestimate the extent of German power in France. Uh, and that I, I uh, uh, also grossly underestimate the amount of, uh, of assistance given to, to Jews by, uh, by uh, French uh, people who are willing to, to help them. Uh, this is extremely difficult to get any serious uh, uh, measurements about. Um, uh, even Jacques Semelin who had written an enormous book about the as he seems to see almost unanimous turn toward helpfulness that happens in 1942. I don't believe it. Uh, he, he's unable to quantify it. Uh, we simply cannot quantify it. Uh, every country, every occupied country had people who helped Jews. This includes Germany. Um, there's a book about the town of Dusseldorf, which happens to have police records. I think most of the other places in Germany managed to burn their police records. But in Dusseldorf, there were hundreds of, of of prosecutions of Germans for uh, aiding Jews or having love affairs with Jews or in various ways uh, uh, violating uh, uh, Nazi legislation. Uh, there, there was no country without, so there's nothing special about the French uh, aid to Jews. Every occupied country had them and we simply can't uh, quantify them. Uh, Semla himself says that, uh, uh, that uh, Jews themselves did a great deal of self-help uh, and, and this, is, this is certainly true. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't, I don't think that I, anyone argues, anyone could possibly argue that this is the major uh, feature in keeping the, the, the number of, of, of uh, Jewish uh, deportees uh, relatively low. Uh, now public opinion also is extremely hard to measure. In democracies, we have many ways to measure public opinion. In the Vichy regime, we have none of them. Uh, there's the press is controlled, there are no elections. Um, but the regime uh, reads an extraordinary number of, of, of letters, steams them up and reads them and sends them on. The, the regime listens to uh, thousands of telephone calls. So we do know something about, um, uh, do know something about public opinion. And it does seem perfectly clear that uh, there was a, a widespread public feeling in the early Vichy period that the Jews were a problem, that Jews had somehow wanted the war to get back at Hitler, that Jews had somehow uh, brought on the problems of the French. The Jews were seen as a problem. We have these wonderful letters to Marshal Pétain from critics who would say, would begin by saying, well, I recognize the Jews are a problem, but, I mean, you've given away half the argument there already. And the, the, the words uh, become less common. Uh, public opinion. There's clearly a shift in public opinion that no one would say is unanimous. Any account of French public opinion that pretends to say that uh, that it was uniform at any point or that it didn't change, uh, they're, they're, they're misleading you. Uh, the country was deeply divided through the 30s. It remained uh, deeply divided, but there was clearly a shift and there was there were clearly a considerable number of people who helped out. But this was never, this was not the primary explanation for the relatively normal number of deportees. Um, and here, can you hear me? Oh dear, sorry. Uh, no, no, I'm just too far from it. Uh, okay, um, let me, uh, 
All right. Uh, now, indifference. Uh, Jacques Semelin and uh, uh, Asher Cohen, a couple of other authors, want to argue that indifference uh, helped the victims. I don't believe it for a moment. I think that indifference means standing aside while a regime does yeah. evil things. And yeah. I find this argument utterly, utterly specious. Uh, um, there's one area of, of criticism that uh, uh, nobody's mentioned, so I'll, I'll mention myself. It, it, it seems to come up more often in the blogs than anywhere else. So it seems to really get a lot of the goat of a lot of French people. And that is that I, I keep harping on how what a small number of Germans there were uh, in France. Uh, German soldiers. The German police uh, had, there were about 3,000 German police in France, and they were capable of doing terrible things, but not to everybody all at once. Uh, there were also, as the invasion began to loom, there were millions of German soldiers on the beach, but they had specific orders. Uh, we, I, I didn't find it, but a friend of mine found it and sent it to me, an order by General Munchstedt that said, uh, to these troops, you will not go off and fight the resistance because you don't have enough gas and you've got to stay on your toes. And so uh, the Germans had about 30,000 troops uh, devoted to internal order, who were separate from the troops that were on the beach. And uh, these were highly armed, uh, they were uh, motorized, and they, uh, they went around from hotspot to hotspot. When, the, when they, the Maquis would set up an encampment somewhere in the Alps or somewhere in the Nazi Sanskrit, they would come in with overwhelming force and destroy it. They were able to wipe out every single encampment uh, of, the, uh, of the French resistance, but they were never able to control the whole countryside. There were plenty of towns who never saw a German soldier. There were, the, the Germans controlled the major cities and the major axes with these 30,000 formidable troops, and they uh, kept the resistance from ever having an effective uh, 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 organized uh, resistance which, they, which would help the Allies uh, liberate the country later on, except possibly one in Brittany. Um, so uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm really underestimating it that this force was formidable, but uh, the Germans had an incredible need for manpower on the Eastern Front. And so they, they, if they had had to administer all of France themselves, they simply couldn't have done it. Uh, the troops, the, the occupation troops, included uh, Ukrainians, they included Uzbeks, they included all sorts of people. Uh, they included Hindus. There was a group near Bordeaux recruited among Indian prisoners of war who were, uh, uh, who were uh, followers of Sabra Chandra Bose, is that his name, the, uh, the Indian independence leader who went to visit Hitler and, and uh, urged the Indians to fight the British Empire. So uh, they didn't have a, a single person to spare. And uh, I, I, uh, I think that I have not underestimated German power, but I've seen its limits. Uh, let me have one minor comment. I think it's very important to analyze the conditions, the specific uh, matters that facilitated uh, deportation. I agree that entirely. The German will and German force comes first. And it seems to have been exercised primarily near active battlefronts. A great deal of the, of the German effort was applied to areas in, in what Timothy Snyder calls the killing grounds between Russia and Germany. Uh, and that's where they put their real uh, weight into this thing. Uh, uh, and in Western Europe, they put real weight into it in Holland, which they thought was going to become part of the German right. Uh, uh, and that finally, I think, was the, was the ultimate uh, decider. Uh, and not public opinion, as Klaus seems to think. Uh, and not that uh, efforts to save, however credible, however brave, or praiseworthy, uh, uh, they, they were uh, a contributor, but not the main factor. So maybe we can let the public ask some questions. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, such an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Sarah Fetterman. I just finished a doctorate studying the role of the French Railroad during the Ooh, war awesome. <laughs> and the conflict that ensues. And I don't mean to put a, I'm not going to put a judicial to us on this, but I um, did want to ask that since you did the book in 1981, two questions. One was uh, the archives for the French National Railroad had not been opened at that point. CNRS hadn't on the, the FLA report and all of that. So I wanted to know if your thoughts had shifted at all on the French Railroad and their level of freedom of marginal move. And the other was, the other thing that's shifted since 1981 is in terms of methodology, whereas testimony wasn't used very much in, in 
uh, study understanding Vichy. And since then, the Spielberg archives have come out and so on, and I suppose um, that your work is still mostly archival, but I want to know if you had any shift in how you think about testimony as uh, in Okay, um, yes, uh, the, the railroad issue, I, I'm not sure I did it justice. Uh, um, Henri Rousseau has given us a category of things that are still out there. I'm not fully dealt with, and that's certainly one. I didn't really study the railroad uh, that fully. Uh, 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 I actually I had, uh, I was uh, in one of my, I think the only serious uh, Time I spent with Sarah Schlarstadt by asking me about the railroads. He said, "Well, the railroads were uh, were, were commandeered by the Germans, and uh, they, they they were effectively they were run by the Germans. And there was nothing more to do about it." And that's I think uh, is, is I think is, I think that comes close to being the case. Uh, if if uh, if the Germans had had to run rail run the railroads themselves, run those trains themselves, they would really have been in, in serious difficulty, and that would. Would have, uh, now, now the sticking point is the fact that the, uh, the French National Railroad charged money. Uh, you had to buy, a, you didn't exactly buy a ticket to be transported to Auschwitz, but the, the, the money was was paid to the French National Railroad. So that makes the thing extremely sticky. I have not been through. There was a state of Maryland that refused to let the, yes. the French National Railroad bid on a uh, railroad modernization project. Yes. Heaven knows we certainly need French railroads. But uh, running through Maryland, but um, um, that was that's the sticking point, and I think that probably the, the other point to be made has to do with uh, the sabotage of railroads, and, uh, and uh, the Belgians uh, sabotaged a, a deportation train, uh, and not they made people actually that way. I mean, they, they, a lot of them ran off in the woods, and they were caught. It was, of course, ghastly in every way, but at least there was an attempt to be made. But no French train was ever sabotaged. No French deportation train. Lots of troop trains were sabotaged. Lots of supply trains were sabotaged. But no deportation. Uh, and that's perhaps harsh medicine. Is that going to help? Really help or not? It's like the issue of bombing Auschwitz. Uh, now, the, the actual testimony, I think, uh, perhaps is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is ticklish because um, for a very long time, the history of this period uh, depended very heavily on testimonies because the archives were open. And I have to confess that I'm firmly in the archives camp. Uh, I have uh, a fair number of direct experiences um, with, um, with the falseness of testimony. Uh, I, I know of one particular, I, I, I lucked into the diary of an important person at Vichy, uh, written in 1943, and um, I, I somehow uh, managed to persuade the family to let me see the diary, and they made a mistake, because the, the person in question had rewritten the diary in 1948, and I was supposed to see the 1948 diary, instead of which I saw the 1943 diary. <laughs> and when they realized the mistake, that was great consternation, but they were, they, were, they, were, uh, they were elegant people, they said, okay, you can keep it till breakfast. <laughs> so I took notes all night, and I remember toward morning the peacock, this was a mass in the south of France, the peacock began to scream in the garden, I said, my God, I won't finish. I didn't finish, but it was totally different from the 1940 diary. So I don't believe a word of these diaries unless, it was, unless the person died or in some way couldn't retouch it. And testimony, um, my own memory of what I did yesterday is totally false. <laughs> And, and when your life depends on making up another version, then you're going to do it. And so, unless something is is, is corroborated, and this is, I'm afraid, an extreme position, and I would be jumped on by a lot of people, but I think unless something is corroborated, I think the, for a period so controversial, when more people went, went to jail or were executed for saying the wrong thing, uh, I, I, I tried not to use testimony. Is the anti-Semitism of the 40s, uh, is there a direct line to today's anti-Semitism, or is today's more a function of Middle East politics? I hope my colleagues will talk about it. I have a, an opinion on the matter, and I'll happily give it. Do you want to say something? <laughs> well, the problem is that many people, including myself, are thinking this is a complete new anti-Semitism. 
even if the structure of anti-Semitism is still the same, I mean, over the ages, the plot, the people who are responsible for war or whatever, but those who are supporting this anti-Semitism today are not at all the same as the one of the 30s or the 40s. This is one of the problems. If you see, for example, the evolution of the National Front, it's very interesting, because the old anti-Semitism has not vanished, of course, it's still there. But it's not. It's less public, publicly expressed. One more time, this difference between Marine Le Pen and her father. Uh, I don't say they, they 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 don't share the same values, but it's not at all the same agenda. Um, the old-fashioned anti-Semitism is still there, but but it's a minor. I mean, a minority. It's there is, for example, one of the problems of the connection between the old one. I mean, the anti-Semitism from the extreme right. And I saw him, not to name it, was one of the uh, kind of nouveau Lucien Robatel, uh, with the talent of the talent of the talent of the And the, uh, the connection with Dieudonné and all this kind of very popular anti semitism linked to the question of a uh, radical Islamist or whatever. So it's a different one. And then the old tools to find anti semitism in France are not relevant anymore. This is one of the most important debates to my point of view today, in front, in, in, in these in this questions. Hi. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just say a little a word about this, this, the same question I made before we go to someone else. Uh, I, I think uh, oh, he's absolutely right. Uh, the uh, anti Semitism uh, waxes and wanes, and, 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 and it. it, it, it uh, to become virulent and affect policy, it seems to to it needs to attach itself to current to conflicts, and and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so there have been times when it was relatively weak in France in the 1920s, for example, at a time when there were no Jewish professors in Ivy League universities. Uh, there were in France, for example. And I, I think I say in my book that at that time, the anti-Semitism was stronger in the United States than it was in France. And that's a, perhaps an extreme position. Um, it's now, but the situation now is, 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 is different for more reasons than Paul Rousseau said. Uh, anti Semitism has been uh, uh, virulent in France at times of massive Jewish immigration. But there is no Jewish immigration now. There is uh, immigration from, from Eastern Europe and from uh, North Africa and from uh, Sub Saharan Africa. And uh, France is uniquely, um, um, has a unique feature of 300. Thousand Jews and 600,000 Muslims. And most of the violent uh, actions are, as far as I know, without exception, uh, done by alienated and angry and unemployed Muslims, uh, with the exception of, of the Carpentras cemetery defamation, which seems to have been part of the old fashioned anti So I, I'm, uh, I think that a great deal, it's much more complex than saying that there's permanent anti Semitism and we go back to the Draper's affair. And one more point, that it was very, very ended, of course, with the acquittal of Dreyfus, but the, at the very same moment uh, in, you know, in Georgia, uh, Leo Frank was lynched. Right. So, um, yeah, we didn't look so good, but that's my view. I was going to dodge this, but I, I just a couple of thoughts came to mind. Uh, one has to do with the role of religion. Uh, it's with the Catholic Church, played a role with anti Semitism in the earlier period. And so I won't say it's a continuity of religion, but just that the religious dimension of it is that I know nobody not saying against the other thing though, I think it has to do with public discourse uh, and that the kind of response that, and I know it's controversial, we can get into the debate about uh, to the Charlie Hebdo uh, event. Uh, it was quite remarkable and I can't think of anything comparable uh, in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen thirties. Uh, so I think as a matter of public discourse, uh, anti-Semitism is out of bounds today uh, in a way with Xavier Vala, a period of famous incident that Bob talks about. When Bloom was uh, installed as Prime Minister of France, and I can't reproduce the line exactly, but this is the first time in our Gallo, history of our Gallo-Roman country that a subtle Talmudist has been put in charge. This is in the Chamber of Deputies that something like this is said by an elected representative. Of, of, the, uh, of the public, who actually went on uh, to be a commissar of, uh, of Jewish affairs under Vichy. Um, I just don't see that being the case today. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Maxwell, I wanted to thank you for the uh, thorough research and your 
decidedly American objectivity with respect to French history, but I just thought I'd, I'd mention Speak up, it. please. Uh, we so can't hear you. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to mention a, a, a few things with, uh, uh, in, in the spirit of trying to put things in, in, in proper context. Can I, can I invite you to please make this a question and not a comment, if you don't mind? What's the Really, we're here to, to listen to Professor Paxton oh, and the camera, so if you could just keep it in a short question, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, well, I can put a question mark at the end of my statement, if you like. I'll just make it. As long as it's such a very short statement, please. Thank you. I think there's, there's a misperception that at the end of World War II, after the liberation, uh, the question is, do you agree with me or do you do not agree with me? And before that, my statement. There's a misperception here that after the end of, of, of the war, liberation, the French just forgot about collaboration, and then American scholars came along, and maybe some other scholars, and reminded them that these terrible things happened. Let's not forget that merely two months after the, the, uh, the, the surrender of Nazi forces in April 1945, July 1945, the French put countless collaborators on trial, including Maréchal Pétain. And the indictment reads, you should read the indictment, you know, it's about, well, helping uh, and put, pushing through anti-Jewish okay, so, laws and whatever. The so let's, let's come to the question, if you don't mind. We have a lot of people here. Okay, fine. Well, I, so what's your question? I'd like to hear it. Would, would, would you agree with me that uh, uh, it's, it's not completely accurate, that the French simply forgot about collaboration, because the French were, were uh, especially the, the regime of General de Gaulle and the three French forces, put so many collaborators on trial, executed so many, condemned Pitta to death, and executed Laval. And I could go on with a lot of other things. Okay. Okay, well, I don't think anyone has ever claimed that the French forgot about collaboration. Uh, the great authority on the, um, the, the working of the memory of each is sitting on, on my right. Uh, but uh, just to dispatch the issue, perhaps, uh, the, 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 the there was a period of, the, of uh, uh, there was a purge, which was relatively, uh, 1,600 people were, were put to death. Um, uh, Thirty some thousand or, or more or less were in prison. There were many people whose careers were interrupted and so forth. And then there was a pardon, there was an amnesty in 51 and 53. And uh, there, is, there was definitely a period when it was talked about much, much less. Uh, so uh, there, is, there is a history that no one has ever, uh, I'm sure people kept them the thoughts in their own heads of those terrible years. I don't think anyone's ever claimed that uh, the French forgot about the collaboration after 1945. Um, yeah, yeah. And let's see. Um, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like you to, I'd like to somewhat the immunity, as you know, because he said he had a soft spot for the Third Republic, to explain uh, uh, why, in the context of anti-Semitism in the 1930s and 1940s, how did the Chambre des Députés, Socialist Chambre Chambre des Députés, give full powers to Paris uh, Pétain, since uh, many socialists were, new, were more Jewish oriented, and also, uh, <laughs> and also a lot of them were anti dreyfusard uh, you pushing that my way, so I was stuck with it. <laughs> and and, and, and the, the questioner is referring to a moment in, uh, in July of 1940 uh, when the National Assembly is meeting together, uh, votes full powers to Marshal Pétain. I, I should know exactly. It's like 460 to 80. I mean, you might know better. 80, 85. In any case, a very, very, 80, very small uh, minority. Uh, I would just say in responsible uh, in response to that I actually had this one. Uh, legislatures get bullied into things uh, and they're doing terrible things and making very very bad decisions and we don't have to look too far in the past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is I don't, I don't mean to minimize that though. I was just to you know keep other uh, parallels. Uh, but second of all, uh, the defeat uh, was uh, dramatic, drastic. Uh, and horrific. Uh, Eight million people were on the roads, not just Belgians, but most of them, uh, most of the uh, French people. Was it eight million? By, yes, yes, uh, ten million. I'm sorry, it's just it's it's massive. Uh, who wasn't there is uh, is also important. Uh, communists were not there. Uh, their party would disband, and if they uh, continued to uh, to oppose the war effort, uh, they were they were sequestered. 
they were not available. Uh, the leading people who were most likely to vote, uh, uh, so you're getting a longer answer than you want, uh, had departed to North Africa, uh, and they were placed under arrest. Uh, by Pink Town, including George Mondale, who we mentioned uh, a little bit uh, a little bit earlier. Paul Reynaud, who was the outgoing prime minister, you might have expected to say something, uh, didn't. Uh, he had suffered a car accident, had his advantages, I know that's an excuse. And Leo Blue, uh, who one also would expect to say something, uh, said he was later, to, uh, it was a terrifying atmosphere. Uh, it's worth mentioning that any number of deputies were away at the front uh, in, in uniform and not on the, and not on the scene. Uh, and that Vichy was, in a manner of speaking, uh, for uh, people of, what's the right way to put it, of uh, deeply Republican views, uh, maybe, not, uh, maybe not friendly territory. Uh, Pierre Laval was on the scene. I know, I see him as more Mephistophelian, uh, I mean, I know you do, Bob, but uh, is more efficacious as a politician, menacing and threatening. Uh, and the threat was, you don't do this, you get Maxime Vegan as a generalissimo, maybe the Germans will take over and run you direct, uh, run you. Uh, why not trust yourself to Maréchal Pétain, the nation's greatest military hero? Uh, and under those circumstances, I don't need to justify the vote, it's just to try to imagine uh, how people might have acted in those circumstances. Uh, I mean, my, my pushback would be that, uh, You've got my view on this. Is that the resistance starts a little earlier, and public affection, uh, disaffection starts earlier, uh, and I, that's the position that I take. Uh, I don't know that I can defend it uh, with Bob and Maury here, but uh, that is uh, that is my uh, my view. And so that there's buyer remorse soon. Uh, it doesn't take that long when the shortages uh, begin uh, begin to kick in. When Pétain uh, shakes hand with Hitler at Montoire, I, I'm I'm going to do that. Bob, you want to? Uh, is there another question? Uh, There's a student back here, I think, has a question. Yes. I can't see you from here. I can't see you from here. Earlier, you, 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 you mentioned something about the police, and that brought to mind the other Felipe that wasn't discussed in this. What is your personal opinion on Felipe Henriot, one of the ministers of the Vichy regime? And his enemy comparisons and contrast between him and Pentan. Well, uh, Fili Olio uh, was, uh, in the last months of the Vichy regime, the regime spokesman. He came, he broadcast uh, on the air, uh, and he was an incredible speaker. I've seen footage of his, uh, of what he said. He had a, he had a coppery voice uh, that, uh, commanded attention and he was extremely adroit and he uh, played upon uh, and fear a great many people had it in the spring of 1944 that when the Allied uh, landing came which in a way they all hoped for terrible things were going to happen and that France was going to be a battleground perhaps for many years as it had been in the living memory in 1914 he was extremely clever um, he was um, uh, shot dead by the resistance at the door of his apartment in uh, the, what, the 28th of June, 1944, somewhat, uh, depriving the Vichy regime of, of, of an extremely effective uh, spokesperson. Uh, another example of our difficulties to study public opinion because he apparently uh, was uh, really, really moved to uh, move people's spirits. Uh, but he was not a policymaker. He was someone who was very skillful putting the case uh, for standing <coughs> even at the very last moment. Uh, yeah, just uh, yeah. one thing about, uh, about the town, I mean, uh, uh, to answer to the two last questions. First, it's very difficult to imagine what was the time in 1940. It was such a tremendous personality, I mean, personality morale. It was, uh, I mean, it was very difficult, including for Bloom and the 80 who refused for powers, to go against the mainstream. And the image we have today about Pétain is so different because we know, we, we know of course, what happened. At the same time, and this to reply to the question of the Middle East and Philippe Mario, Pétain was not sharing the same value as the Middle East. It's clear. Even he condemned, in a certain sense, some crimes of the Middle East in 1944. But the major responsibility, I don't say crime, I'm not a lawyer, but 
the major responsibility of Pétain that he decided never resign. He never resigned, including when he, he, uh, he was taken to Germany in the uh, Sigmaringen castle, he refused to resign and then he willingly assume all the behavior and all what has been done by the, uh, the Vichy regime, even if he has no more power at that time. This is, to my point, to explain responsibility. Um, is there time for one, one more? Yes. One, one more question. Yes. Uh, I survived the Vichy regime. I moved seven times. 1940 and 1944, and uh, there's no time for me to tell you my story, but we have discussed it, Professor Faxton. I just want to say, I just want to say in conclusion that whether or not the Vichy regime resulted in some French Jews being saved depended on a number of personal factors including luck, right? I was lucky and the, some member of my family were not. The Vichy regime in 1941, 1942, especially as far as French nationality Jews were concerned, provided an area where they were relatively safe. And it enabled some of us to gain time if you could get enough time from hiding in point A to point B to point C, you were lucky and you could reach the end. Particularly the Italian occupation zone was a great refuge which became a mousetrap when Italy capitulated in September 1943. But the Italians, like the French, don't necessarily follow orders. <laughs> and, and there were people, when we say Vichy, we think of Laval and Pétain, but there were a lot of underlings who didn't necessarily go along and get some help. I'll just give you a very brief one sentence, of the story. In 1944, we were in Lomondo, in the department of Guido. 400 Jews in that department were arrested in 1944. But, in Le Mondo, we received help from La Mairie and the people. They told my aunt, we know your papers are all forged. Don't worry, I have a list where your name does not appear. When they come to ask me who are refugees in the town, I don't, I show them a list where the Jews do not appear. So there were all kinds of cases, everybody had a different experience. Thank you. I'll be very brief. The unoccupied zone should have been an area where Jews were safe, safer, uh, until November 1942. If you were a, a, a foreign Jew, this didn't apply at all, because we, she was busy handing you over to the Nazis. If you were a French citizen, you were uh, perhaps not going to be handed over to the Nazis, but you lost your job, you lost your property, your name and address were on a card file at the police headquarters, uh, and I could go on. Uh, now, individual, I, I don't think the French government, the Vichy government, um, uh, knowingly uh, helped people as a government. Some of the policemen warned people, all these stories are, are, are pretty well known, but uh, the, there was luck that you said that, and there were individuals, some of them in, in uh, responsible positions, who did uh, courageous things, and that's, Absolutely true. Thank you. Thank you so much.